Welcome to the latest Fettle In Conversation. I'm Jeff Hall, and today I'm introducing Russell Gunson, who's the director of IPPR Scotland. Could you tell us a little bit about IPPR, Russell? Yeah, IPPR is the Institute for Public Policy Research. Uh, in Scotland, we're one of only a few think tanks, um, and we're a progressive think tank, cross-party, with charitable status, and we've been doing a great deal of work on the education and skill system throughout our time of existence. So could you tell us a little bit about this large project that you're undertaking in Scotland and Northern Ireland? Yes, so this project working with Vettel um, is looking at what a 21st century skill system should look like in both Scotland and Northern Ireland. And it's a comparator project, so we're looking very closely at not only the similarities between Northern Ireland and Scotland's skills system, but also the differences. And then likewise, in terms of what the skills systems are facing, so the economic context, the political context, the social context. And there are striking similarities between Scotland and Northern Ireland, but as you can probably expect, big, big differences. And that's already led to some very interesting differences in terms of what we found, but also where we may go in terms of the recommendations for the skill systems too. Well, we'll explore some of those differences and similarities. The project, as I said, is a large one. Would you like to tell us about the different phases and where you've got to so far? Yes, yeah, the second bit of work that we've done with Vettel. So the first was focused on Scotland and it was focused on what the challenges facing the skill system in Scotland are. And that was released in 2017. Um, this project is a three-stage project. So the first stage is looking just at Northern Ireland um, and almost catching up our analysis, if you like. So doing the challenges work that we did in Scotland last year, but in Northern Ireland. So what are the big, um, again, challenges facing the skills system um, across the board, whether that be economic, social, political or otherwise. The second stage um, has then moved on to, given those challenges, what does success look like? And the really important thing on both the stage one and stage two parts of the report of the project has been to make sure that they have been owned by the skill system itself. So it's not us as so-called experts coming in to tell either Northern Ireland or Scotland skill system what they should think. It's very much been about surfacing um, the, the views of the skill system in both Northern Ireland and Scotland. So stage two was around what success looks like, and that's roughly where we are. So we just um, released the report on that, a joint report, looking at both Scotland and Northern Ireland, what would success look like. And um, that's on the website. That is it? on the website, and that came out, I think, in July of 2018. And then the next step, which is what we're in the midst of, um, it's all been exciting, but this bit is, I suppose, where it gets even more exciting, if you like that type of thing, um, is when we begin to make recommendations. So what should change, but crucially, what should stay the same? Because as we all know, within education policy more broadly, within skill system policy uh, specifically, um, it can often be overkill in terms of change and it can often be ministers or others um, you know, changing things before uh, the previous strategy is embedded at all. So what needs to change, what needs to stay the same is the next uh, stage three, and that's where we'll finish with what we hope are big key recommendations around what would make a 21st century skill system in Scotland and separately in Northern Ireland too. I think we need to explore, first of all, before getting into any of the detail, what's your understanding of a skill system? What, what does it embrace? So what we have defined it uh, as for ourselves, across both um, Northern Ireland and Scotland, is pretty much all education, learning and training beyond the age of 16. So that includes uh, the secondary, well, upper secondary part of the school system all the way through to universities with everything in between, so colleges, apprenticeships, all in work learning. The focus of the report though in terms of the analysis or the reports and the project have been around post-school sub-degree. Mm -hmm. um, now of course recommendations for that part of the system will have implications for schools and for universities, but we found um, um, certainly we think that that part of the skill system has been underlooked at, if you like. It hasn't had the attention that schools and universities have had, both in terms of research, but actually in terms of politics and in terms of the political attention. And too often they get overlooked as if they're Cinderella parts of the skill system. Whereas actually where we're going with this is that they could be, if not will be, 
uh, the most important part, looking ahead to what we face. Excellent, and obviously given my background, it's very pleasing to see the emphasis on FE colleges and, and training providers and employers who actually do train. So uh, let's move on to uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. If you did Scotland first, what did you see there as the uh, emerging challenges for the skills system in Scotland? Yes, yeah, so in, in Scotland there's been huge change. So we've had mergers of colleges um, only, you know, it feels a long time ago, but only three, four, five years ago. We've introduced um, an outcome-based approach to funding at least colleges and universities, if not the rest of the system, with new things called outcome agreements, uh, which are uh, agreements between the funding council that funds colleges and universities and the colleges and universities themselves. Um, the aim being to, I suppose, maximise the impact from the public funding going in uh, to college and university education. Beyond that, you've seen um, big changes in terms of funding, so funding cuts just like across the rest of the UK since the crash. We've seen public funding drop. We've also seen private funding drop. And at the same time, long-standing economic um, challenges in Scotland. So we've got uh, productivity that is, uh, has improved, but it's flatlined recently and it's lower than the rest of the UK. Um, we've got inactivity levels that are relatively high to the rest of the UK in Scotland. And a big thing to come back to potentially um, later in the conversation is around career progression. So how many low paid workers are moving out of low pay every quarter? So again, that's improved, but it's improved in Scotland from a low base. And in the UK, we're quite bad at that uh, compared to our international competitors too. Now, none of these things, you know, whether it be productivity, inactivity, career progression, are entirely the responsibility of the skill system. It's not like you could pull a lever, change the skill system and fix any or all of those. But we do think there's a big responsibility, a big um, uh, interaction between the skill system and those issues. And they're really important, not just in and of themselves, but those things lead to pay, those things lead to in work poverty levels, those things lead to, in essence, the quality of life that people can have. Um, so in Scotland, those were the big challenges of now. Looking ahead, which is the whole point of the project, looking um, across the rest of this century, which is quite an ambitious task, yeah. given where we are. It's quite hard to look ahead more than a few months sometimes, but um, that's the task we set ourselves. Looking ahead, there are three big challenges facing Scotland. Um, automation, so again, no doubt we can come back to that. Yeah. Aging, um, so Scotland ages more quickly and more steeply than the rest of the UK. And um, a term that uh, has been used in Scotland at least quite liberally, but inclusive growth. But in short, what that means is how do you get the economy working for a start, but secondly, working in a way that narrows inequalities rather than what we've seen over the last 10, 20, 30 years, which is an economy that works or doesn't, but it certainly doesn't work to narrow inequalities. So those were the big challenges we faced uh, when we looked at it from Scotland. And again, these were aired from the skill system itself with evidence underpinning it, but with lots of interviews, lots of roundtables, lots of qualitative work with those in the skill system and those around the skill system to hear what they thought the challenges that they faced were. Um, I live in Northern Ireland, so I think I can imagine that the challenges that you've just uh, described so clearly in Scotland would be found in Northern Ireland. And I'm going to suggest that Northern Ireland probably has lower productivity, more inactivity, and possibly uh, more of an ageing population. Is that not true? So certainly two out of three. So you're two out, uh, of, two three. out of three, so absolutely. Um, and there's been, I think this has been a long-standing um, issue in Northern Ireland. You can go back to the Troubles, you can look at the geographical place of Northern Ireland and that will no doubt have an effect. But you're right, lower productivity levels. Again, there's been a big catch up since the peace process and uh, over the last 10, 20 years in particular, but a catch up from a very, very low base compared to the rest of the UK. So there's a good record on one hand, but a, a poor level overall. And yes, in activity levels, we found a really interesting, or we think so anyway, um, interesting point around an activity within Northern Ireland. So that's economic inactivity is people that are neither employed nor looking for a job. 
So a lot of them will either be long-term sick or just given up, so far excluded from the labour market that they don't see um, the point in even trying. And that, just to be clear, is, as far as we see it, a problem with the labour market, not a problem with the individual's concern. But yes, a much higher rate overall, but really importantly, that gap between Northern Ireland's higher rate of inactivity and the rest of the UK opens up at the age of around 40. So up to that period in Northern Ireland, it's it narrow, it, it pretty much mirrors, should I say, um, the rate in the rest of the UK. But at the age of 40, that opens up. 10 years ago, we found it was around the age of 30. So there's a little bit of a cohort effect here where damage maybe from the troubles, maybe from the economic um, scarring effects of having a poorly performing economy 20, 30 years ago. Either way, um, there is a cohort effect where there's 30 year olds 10 years ago, 40 year olds now, who knows what happens in the future, that are much more likely to be inactive than in the rest of the UK. Um, the one that was slightly different um, in Northern Ireland compared to Scotland was around um, the rates of um, uh, progression. So much lower again in Northern Ireland than in Scotland. So those that are in low pay work stay. in Northern Ireland stay there for the rest of their careers. Um, and around um, pay, so what I didn't mention, of course, is that um, real wages, both in Northern Ireland and Scotland, haven't even recovered to where they were before the crash yet. Again, not solely the responsibility of the skill system, but um, absolutely something the skill system can help contribute to fix. You mentioned earlier the uh, development of outcome agreements in Scotland. Obviously, one outcome of an education system is qualifications. And again, because I live in Northern Ireland, I'm very aware that on the one hand, A-level results, the gold standard that everybody recognises, are very good in Northern Ireland. And yet, I think you uh, describe that there are higher numbers of people with no qualifications at all in Northern Ireland, more so than in Scotland. Yes. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yes, so this is a good example of where we focused on the post-school sub-degree level, but actually, in doing so, there are implications for the rest of the system. So the school system in Northern Ireland, um, just as a bit of a description, so it's uh, selective, so there's still an 11 plus, but it's also um, divided by community background too. So yes. there, are, there are schools that are, are Catholic predominantly schools and schools that are more Protestant schools. Um, so you have a you know, relatively divided school system and what we found is that there are a really significant proportion of pupils coming out of the school system, particularly from the, the secondary modern, the, the, the general part of the system as opposed to the grammar school part, with no qualifications at all, or if they do have qualifications, low levels of qualifications, much higher than in the rest of the UK. So clearly, for whatever reason, the school system is failing a really substantial part of the cohort of young people going through it in Northern Ireland. And therefore, the rest of the skill system has to pick up a lot of the slack. So you find a really significant proportion of A-levels are actually delivered by colleges in Northern Ireland, much more so than hires the equivalent um, uh, qualification in Scotland. That's the picture that we start with. And now we have to superimpose on that these challenges of automation and ageing in particular. So automation, it's, it's out there, but can you make it more concrete? How might it affect Scotland and Northern Ireland? And why should the skills system be looked to to try and ameliorate any impact? I think when you mention automation, there's usually two responses elicited from your audience. And one is um, either a a sort of uh, utopia or dystopia where the robots come over and take your job and you'll, you'll never work again for good or for bad. Um, the other is almost that this is too big, you know, this sounds like scaremongering, I can't believe this is really going to happen and we'll surely just carry on as we are. We don't really buy into either camp, so from our analysis we've found that 49% um, of jobs in Northern Ireland, 46% of jobs in Scotland or high potential of automation, but crucially, that doesn't mean the jobs vanish, and it certainly doesn't mean that we carry on as we are. What that means is that up to half, close to half, of jobs are likely to change significantly. So not go, 
but change. And that's why retraining or upskilling um, or lifelong learning, whatever the term, becomes so important because where there's change and where the economy is changing significantly, where there's disruption, we need to be able to manage that in a way that gets workers, people through it. So that's training, that's retraining, that's getting people ready and also that's responding to the change when it happens. So automation to us is one of the biggest, in fact it already is happening, never mind a future challenge. Um, you know, look at the car mechanic when you go and get your car fixed, they plug a computer into the computer in your car now, um, go to your local supermarket and there's self-service checkouts in a way that just wasn't there even just a few years ago. Things are changing already, but looking ahead we think that change will increase and we do think it will be substantial, but that's the word, change, not um, jobs vanishing, not us all kicking back on holiday because the robots have taken over or we're still enslaved to the robots because they've taken over um, our jobs. So automation we think is an absolutely crucial factor that we need to get the skill system and more generally policy makers focused on. Um, and the skill system can be one of the single biggest and best ways to prepare for uh, what will be a significant change to the economy. I know you did um, extensive field work and you've interviewed people from across the spectrum, employers, providers and so on. Did you find that they were aware of the challenges of automation? I think it, depend, it depended who you spoke to. So um, we spoke to a lot of um, business people within different sectors, so within retail. Um, for example, the people we spoke to there were fully aware of um, the challenge as it exists now and um, you know, really putting their heads to what they can do in the future. Um, other sectors may be less so. So if you, you, know, you spoke to uh, construction, if you spoke to other parts of the economy, they didn't quite see it in the same way. And again, it was split into those two camps, um, which again, I don't think get it right. So one is all the jobs are going to vanish, what do we do? The other is surely everything will be okay. Um, the real answer is you need to prepare, you need to take action, otherwise it may not be. Um, but we can, we can get a skill system that absolutely prepares people for the change that is coming, prepares employers for the change that is coming, and in a way gets skill levels up and progresses people away from danger, if you like, in terms of automation disrupting uh, their jobs. Your argument's very persuasive, compelling even, and yet it's against a background where I think you're also describing that in-work training, employer training, training for younger adults in particular seems to have disappeared? Well, just at the time. So if you do take just um, automation, ageing could be a similar argument actually in that the proportion of the working age population compared to the pensioner population will drop really significantly in both Northern Ireland and Scotland. So we're going to need to get more out of the existing or remaining workforce. So either way, um, you can make a really good argument that it's the over 21, over 25 in-work provision that will be most important to getting us ready and also getting us, um, I suppose, responding to the changes that we see. Yet, just at that point, when we can begin to see that as the most important part of the system, everybody has stepped away from that provision. So in Scotland in particular, actually, um, public funding has been focused on young and focused on full-time provision Quite rightly, mm -hmm. you know, the crash happened 10 years ago pretty much to this day um, and youth unemployment in the last recession was a huge scarring mm -hmm. factor for people but for the economy too. And Scotland has been very successful at keeping youth unemployment relatively low um, and keeping it pretty much historically low now. But in doing that and in focusing on young and full time, public funding has stepped away from the older provision and certainly older in work provision. At the same time as that, private companies have also um, begun to invest less and also invest less in that age cohort. So we found, um, interestingly but also worryingly, that if you're high skilled within the workplace, you're more likely to receive investment from your employer in terms of your skills than if you're low skilled. So pretty much if you're low or mid-skilled, um, over the age of 21, there aren't really any options for you. Maybe that's overstating it, but certainly there's far less options for you compared to other uh, parts of the system. In Northern Ireland, it's slightly less pronounced, so they have kept um, 
more of a focus on all age groups. They have kept a bit more flexibility in the system. But looking at it, I don't think you could say that Scotland or Northern Ireland are yet uh, ready for the changes that we know will be coming, well, and as I say, have already started. I followed the broader picture, but I think you did find some good examples in both Scotland and Northern Ireland of um, incentives that had produced good results. Uh, the Assured Skills Scheme in Northern Ireland is one that uh, is widely praised. Uh, do you want to yeah. tell us a little bit about that? So Assured Skills, um, it started with Northern Ireland's attempts to, and successful attempts actually, to take foreign direct investment uh, into Northern Ireland and the logic being that um, those companies that wish to invest in Northern Ireland want to know that there will be skills absolutely tailored to their needs um, if they do and when they do. So assured skills was to give an assurance to those investing in Northern Ireland, those employers investing in Northern Ireland, that they will get tailored skills provision um, to uh, meet their needs. And it works by um, the provision, the skills system provision being shaped by that employer that is investing. Um, the learners uh, come along for quite a short burst of intense learning, often 16 weeks or so. And out of the end of that, there's uh, a bit of contingency, if you like, on the uh, employer to at least interview those that have been successful through the course. So it's quite a nice, um, in my view, quite a logical scheme where the public sector invests and funds the learning. The employer both shapes the learning but also provides an interview at the end for those that have been successful. And the learner, if they, again, are successful through that 16-week course, know that at the end there will be something for them that they can at least get an opportunity from. So that seems to us to be a really interesting intervention that if you like, maximises the, the investment from uh, the public sector in terms of its impact. And we'd like to see a bit more of that. And I think, again, the over 21, the over 25 provision could be ripe for that type of contingent funding. A little deal, if you like, or a partnership between uh, the private sector, between the learner and between the state, which is the state invests. The employer progresses that, um, that worker if they succeed through their learning and the learner. Um, if they're successful, knows that something will happen at the end of it. What you're describing there to meet the challenges is collaboration, uh, a coherent skill system where employers, uh, organisations of the state and learning providers such as colleges and, and training providers are working together. Are you seeing signs of that? I, I mean, I've certainly heard of some moves in that direction in Scotland, clearly a little more difficult in Northern Ireland where there isn't a a government as such, but are you, are you optimistic? Yeah, well, yes, I'm, I'm inherently optimistic, but um, when it comes to Northern Ireland, I think you're right to say they're starting from a, a, a lower base, if you like, in terms of collaboration than in Scotland. So in Northern Ireland, we did pick up on a, a great deal of unhelpful competition, particularly between the school system and the college system, whereby given funding being tight, uh, schools will hold on to pupils longer maybe than in the pupils interests um, and have begun to, tr to stray into uh, vocational and FE qualifications in a way that maybe they're not expert at delivering. So again, it might be in the best interest of the school but it might not be in the best interest of the pupil. So just an example there of where competition can be unhelpful mm. um, and we think that in Northern Ireland there's there's a need to get a bit closer to that collaboration model than the competition one. In Scotland, I think this is where Scotland does um, have an advantage and where it has begun to make progress, which is putting policies in place at least, and we'll see if the reality matches those policies over the coming time, but policies in place that really do foster that collaborative spirit rather than the competition spirit. So if you like, there's an example of much more of a system approach in Scotland than in Northern Ireland. Um, there's been uh, the Scottish Funding Council exists in a way that it's the Northern Ireland Executive when it's up and running that um, funds colleges directly and the rest of the skill system. Equally, the outcome agreements are about bringing colleges together at the regional level to collaborate rather than compete for the learners' interests. And then beyond that, you've also seen um, just, a, I suppose, the Learner Journey Review, which has been a big review 
into, mm. um, as it suggests, yeah. the, the routes through the system that learners take. And the Wood Commission, um, all two or three of those initiatives in Scotland have been really important at bringing the system together around the needs of the learner, uh, at least in theory, rather than allowing administrative divides or competition within the system to dictate what learners can get, what they can access. So in Scotland, I think there's been, um, again, in policy terms, a real focus on this for the benefit of the skills system. In Northern Ireland, I think that's where there can be some learning that, that flows across um, from Scotland to Northern Ireland to show that a collaborative system can be a much more successful one for the learner and for the, the outcomes that the system produces rather than a very competitive one. The administration of the school system in Northern Ireland is now the responsibility of the education authority. Uh, and I think I'd be accurate in saying there isn't a lot of dialogue between the education authority and the skills system as you define it. Is that fair? It seems to be fair. That's certainly been um, what we found in our interviews and in our research events. That's certainly been the feedback we've got. And that's, you know, we, we aren't yet at the point of making recommendations. That will come over this next few months. But it's certainly the, the direction we're looking at. What, what can you do to bring the parts of the skill system that need to come together for learners' benefit, uh, bring them together in a way that focuses on the outcome for the learner, rather than uh, a much more sort of input approach, if you like, where we fund schools to the level that we do because we always have, or we keep places at universities and colleges um, at the same level as we always have had. And even within that, within Northern Ireland, you've got subject areas, so like teaching, um, you know, medicine, law, accountancy, that have stayed pretty much stuck, despite all the huge changes that have happened in the economy over that time. So moving away from that input approach to a much more outcome approach, and equally bringing the skill system or the parts of the skill system that need to come together, um, we think Northern Ireland can learn a lot from Scotland. We're really moving now, aren't we, to the second stage where you're trying to identify what the success measures might be for a successful skills system. So we're already talking about more collaboration. What are the other features that you think have to be in place uh, to ensure that kind of success? Yeah, so the, the first two reports that we talked about at the start of this conversation um, were looking at the challenges. The report that came out in July of, um, of this year, 2018, was looking together, Northern Ireland and Scotland, at what success would look like for the skills system given these challenges. And again, it was surfaced from the skills systems themselves rather than us coming in to tell them what was best, which, as you can imagine, wouldn't have gone down, I think, particularly well in either Northern Ireland or Scotland. But the successes, as we see it, almost flow from the challenges, as you would expect. So it's um, a report, I think one of the only reports that's looked at Northern Ireland and Scotland together, uh, particularly around the skill system. Too often both um, Northern Ireland and Scotland, and potentially Wales, compare themselves only with England rather than across um, the way, which I think actually can be a bit more fruitful um, at points. But the successes flow from the challenges, so looking at um, collaboration would be one, looking at how you can improve employer engagement and increase employer investment, particularly amongst smaller employers. So in the future, if we um, are likely to see bigger levels of self-employment, bigger levels of gig employment, and greater numbers of small and micro businesses, then we need to get the skills system ready for that. In a way, it needs to be ready now already, um, but uh, we are where we are. Beyond that, looking at how you can um, foster an outcomes approach with a bit more coherence across the system. And then beyond that, looking at the, the three biggies around um, automation, ageing, and again, this term, inclusive growth. So success in those territories would be much more about mid-career provision, much more about in-work pr provision for older workers, um, much more about boosting productivity and progression, um, and beyond that, looking at how the economy uh, can be influenced by the skill system to produce stronger performance, yes, but fairer performance too. So the success measures do flow from the challenges. Um, they, we can talk through them more, but you can imagine they can get high level, they can get um, a little bit broad brush. The, the real crunchy bit comes in how. 
how do you then improve employer engagement? How do you get investment up? Um, how do you drive progression? And there's some, I think, clues in the, the report from July, um, but there will be some tangible recommendations coming over the next couple of months too. Certainly, if you look at the history uh, in England, it has been one of what now looks like almost perpetual structural change uh, uh, and policy shifts. Do you detect in Scotland, um, to the extent that Northern Ireland can fall into this given it doesn't have ministers, but do you detect a greater willingness to look at collaboration, coherence, rather than just tinkering with structures? I think just on Northern Ireland for a second, so the, um, the breakdown in the power sharing agreement and the lack of a devolved administration just now is obviously a big negative for change. You know, if you are looking at some of this transformative change that we need to to see, given the challenges we face, given what success uh, looks like, um, then not having ministers in place can be a real drawback. On the other hand, in Northern Ireland, not having ministers in place has led to a period of stability, which I think is interesting. <laughs> so by no means does is that, that going necessarily... to be one of your recommendations? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I don't <laughs> think so. But, um, but interestingly, it's been a, a sort of unintended consequence, I think but it has allowed things to bed in. Now we are reaching the point in Northern Ireland where a number of the strategies need refreshed or replaced. Mm -hmm. um, 2020 I think was the year that most of them uh, run out. So we're, we're getting into, we're running on empty if you like on a number of the, the strategies. And, but equally there are things you can do without politicians and I think you shouldn't be dependent if you like on um, the, the ministers and politics to make a change. There are things that the skill system employers, learners could do together without them. So just as an aside, I think it's an interesting, <laughs> um, uh, certainly different uh, context to England where, as you say, I think perpetual change has been the, perpetual revolution has been the, the mantra. In Scotland, I think since the evolution, so since 99, when the Scottish Parliament received its devolved powers, you've seen very, well, certainly some good examples of cross-party, almost generational change and within the education system. So rather than the constant churn and change in direction from one government to the next, you have seen some, um, again, some generational policies put in place in Scotland. The obvious example being curriculum for excellence in the school system, which hasn't, you know, it has its critics, it has its supporters, but without question it's been a 20-year process that's been followed through by all colours of, of government. And within the post-school skill system, you have seen, um, without question, a, a sort of long-term approach to policy. So we haven't seen big changes uh, pivoting from one extreme to the other every few years. Um, what, I suppose, the downside of that, though, is have you seen the transformational change that you need to see? So sometimes big change is required, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that can't be done by consensus. Sometimes that needs to be um, a bit of a, a punt sometimes. Looking at Ireland now for a second, we haven't done that as part of the, the report, but you can see that Ireland did make a big choice um, back in the 80s and 90s uh, through its institutes of technology mm -hmm. um, and they have successfully, I think, with that choice, uh, reshaped the economy into probably a higher performing economy than certainly most of the UK. Uh, not only through that, but it has been a big part of it, the, the Institutes of Technology. So in Scotland, I think where we are now is that we've, we've had a period of change three, four, five years ago, particularly in the college system. Do we need to see something similar in the rest of the skills system? And is the level of ambition in Scotland uh, reaching the same level as the level of challenge that we face? And I think that's a question that's open and up in the air. Um, there are a number of uh, opportunities, I think, for this big change. So in Scotland, the enterprise and skills bodies have come together under a, a strategic board, as it's called. So the, the enterprise and skills strategic board brings together the economic development part of government agencies with the skills part. And I think there's some really interesting possibilities yeah. from that. How can you get businesses and employers a bit more focused on skills investment as a way to grow their business? I think would be an obvious place to go. Likewise around um, the skills strategies that are in place, I think there's, there's due to be a refresh in Scotland too. So is that going to be tweaking or is that going to be quite fundamental change? 
Um, and then lastly, around the outcome agreement, so can we learn from what has been big change in parts of the system recently and spread that across? Um, so in our view, again, the recommendations will come, um, but the direction of travel is, uh, do we need to have a little bit more of a, a level of ambition for the skill system, given the level of challenge and change that we face in Scotland? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I suppose, in fairness, we ought to say Northern Ireland was uh, ahead of the game when it instituted its mergers of colleges long before any of the other nations. So they took 16 uh, and designed six. Uh, there was some trepidation everywhere else, uh, but they created robust, resilient organisations. And as I've said before, I live there, and it's, it's a joy, actually, to go around seeing new campuses being built seemingly everywhere. Uh, and that reflects the, the public nature of the skills system, I think, and the willingness to invest. Uh, it's also a feature of Scotland. Yeah, so. and I think, um, so Northern Ireland were ahead of the game on a few, and uh, so the colleges in Northern Ireland are very much more involved in research and development in um, what would ordinarily be higher education research, in innovation, bit of a buzzword, but in innovation um, policy too, the colleges are involved as much, or at least to some extent, um, as the universities in a way that just doesn't happen in Scotland just now. So ahead of the game in a few ways, I think, Northern Ireland, and the margins would be another example. You've, you go around Northern Ireland, and as we have as part of the project, and it's been personally fascinating regardless of, of the work, but um, the buildings are brand new, you know, the, the investment in the capital of colleges is huge, and these become almost temples of learning, if you like, in parts of Northern Ireland that have seen big divides. Um, so hopefully, beacons of hope um, around the education system in Scotland, we're beginning to see something similar. So the newly merged colleges, similarly, I think, have seen a big, huge investment in capital. Some of the, the best buildings, in fact, I think they've won awards, um, the City of Glasgow, for example, um, architectural awards. Who would have thought that 10, 15, yeah. 20 years ago? Um, so ahead of the game, yes, in Northern Ireland. And I think, again, that's where some of the learnings flowed from Northern Ireland into Scotland in recent years, which is these merged colleges can work, they can bring benefits to learners, and they can become part, a big part, of, of getting what we've always hoped for between colleges and universities, which is parity of esteem uh, and parity of quality. Yes, I think we've all heard about navigating the ships into harbour at uh, City of Glasgow College's Marine Institute. Should we dare just step into territory that perhaps we're not supposed to go into, and that's <laughs> universities? Because I think one of your findings is that um, graduates can often be underemployed in work, so they're working below, and you get this kind of job blocking down yeah. the line. So where people would normally go into posts with a with a FE vocational qualification or an apprenticeship, they're not available. Uh, have you any thoughts on that, or anything to say about that? Yes. Yeah, so put, well, in both Northern Ireland and Scotland, that is a phenomenon, and um, in Northern Ireland. Uh, a really interesting innovation has been what they call the skills barometer. So it's um, a bit of work to try and uh, have a look at the demand for skills versus the supply of skills across the whole of the skill system in Northern Ireland. And again, that's something I think Scotland could look at at the national level. We do that in the regional level more so. But what that finds is that you've got um, a very high level of skill in Northern Ireland, lots of graduates being produced, but their skills are not being well utilised. Now some of that might be because the subject areas don't match up. So the, the anecdote you get is that Northern Ireland produces lots of teachers, lots of public sector focused graduates, and then exports them to the rest of the UK mm. because there aren't the jobs in Northern Ireland to do it. And again, they haven't changed the numbers coming through those courses in a way that maybe they should look at. Um, so the sum of that, which is, is the subject area matching up to the demand area. And likewise in Scotland, there's a bit of that too. Um, and there's two responses. So one is, well, probably three. So one is to change the shape of provision. So begin to allow the system at university level or elsewhere to flex with the, the changes in the economy a lot better. And that outcome approach, certainly in theory, should allow you to do that. The second one is about driving improvements in the economy. So some of this might be around um, the economy just not being able to sustain that level of higher skill. There may not just be the opportunities at that higher level, um, which as you say means that graduates are in uh, lower level jobs than we maybe hope and expect 
which blocks um, the opportunities for others. But the third approach, and this I think is where the school system can come in a bit more closely, is almost about, um, if you forgive the term, but retrofitting um, new skills onto people that already have um, high skills. So there's a really good project in Scotland that we looked at called Code Clan, um, which if assured skills is something in Northern Ireland that Scotland can learn from, then I think Code Clan is something in Scotland that Northern Ireland can learn from. But it takes um, any graduate, this is the sort of pitch if you like, any graduate um, in almost any subject and within 16 weeks it can turn that person, if they want to, into a coder, into a software designer. Um, so within 16 weeks um, you can be retrofitted again, forgive the term, um, from a degree student uh, of any colour into, um, into a coder. And the employment rates out of that course are up at 90 mm. odd percent. Mm. Um, the pay rates are, are very high as you can expect. And you can see how that ties in with an economy that, in Scotland at least, is beginning to go in that direction hugely. So that really intense burst of learning with a, not a guarantee by any means, but a certain uh, level of expectation of, of a job at the end. And then crucially, that course, because it is every 16 weeks, changes every 16 weeks. So they work very, very closely with the coding and the, the software and more generally the IT um, sector to make sure that the provision is right up to date so that in a way it's the sector that is its employers that are teaching um, yeah. people in that in that course. So that retrofitting idea could be a really good one I think to as, 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 a, as part of the mix to making sure that the graduates that come through the system are utilised, their skills are used um, and that's not only an economic you know, it's important for the economy, but it's also important for for people's lives to make sure that they feel like um, all the effort and work that they put in to, to get their degree, to get their learning, has been worthwhile. I suppose to uh, those of us mainly from an FE background have seen what Northern Ireland did, seen the area-based reviews in England recently leading mm -hmm. to many mergers, same as happened in uh, FE in Wales and Scotland. We do just wonder and that's all one would dare do at this <laughs> stage, whether there may be too many universities and too many university places. Uh, but perhaps that's a subject uh, for the third <laughs> one. I'll give you more notice of that one. Uh, just moving to the social inclusion agenda, though, and, and it does link back to, to universities, were we too restricted in what we thought social mobility meant? Did we think it meant the child from a family where nobody previously had been to university was the, the golden key and should we have taken a broader view of social inclusion? Should we be trying to move far more people up a peg or two rather than one or two leaping to the highest levels? So I think the first thing, you know, there's a false dichotomy in, well there's a, a few of them within the school system and education more generally, you know, the, the choice between young and old is a false choice. You need to do both in terms of provision. The choice between those that are out of work and those that are in a work, again, false choice. You need to have provision that's focused on both. And the other one is universities versus colleges or universities versus the rest of the system. It's a false choice. Um, we do need really strong universities um, and Scotland, well and Northern Ireland actually, but Scotland has some very strong, you know, I think the they certainly sell, uh, sell themselves as world-class universities. Five in the top uh, 200, yes. I think. Is I was always natural. told that self-praise is no praise, but, um, <laughs> but there you go. Um, but uh, we do have very strong universities and we need them. But the crucial thing, and I sat on the Commission on Widening Access that Dame Ruth Silver chaired um, in Scotland, the crucial thing is that they have to be fair access to those opportunities. So we need roughly the proportion of people that go through our university system for the future, we do, but we also need that that opportunity is open to um, the full broad potential in the population. And there's far too many sort of clunky, if you like, and inaccurate ways of measuring that potential, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if grades are the only measure, then of course you're not going to get um, a fair balance through your university system. More generally though, I think you're absolutely right to say that that isn't the only way to drive, whether it's social mobility, whether it's fairness, whether it's equality, whether it's justice, um, a term that's coming back into vogue, I think. But um, it's not the only way, and you do need to look to other parts of the skill system to get both, I suppose, the maximising of potential, but also the realising of that potential. Not everyone at the age of 
17 or 18 will know what they want to do um, and we need to have chances for people throughout their lives to learn, to train, to upskill, uh, dare I say it, lifelong learning um, throughout. And so that puts the focus, I think, a bit more on the rest of the system, on universities too, as I've described, but on the rest of the system too. And um, that false choice I talked about between those that are in work and out of work, I think becomes really interesting there because looking to the future, for us, it has to be about progression, career progression for those in work, getting people from low pay into higher pay, and if not, getting them into some of the, the highest paid pr professions. And that needn't be the university route. For us, that mm. should be as much about um, in-work training, in-work learning. Now, in Scotland, there's some interesting, I think, foundations to build on. So we've, in Scotland, introduced both foundation apprenticeships, which are focused on, as the name would suggest, um, sort of lower level of qualification apprenticeships, level one, level two, in common parlance, but also graduate level apprenticeships, um, which take you all the way up to the equivalent of a degree, if not a master's. Now, the aim there, certainly written aim, is that they're not just open to people, firstly, that are young, and secondly, that have lower levels of skill already, they should be as much about taking graduates that have gone out into the workplace to top up their qualifications as others. The risk there though is that whether the apprenticeship system is the right system for everyone at all age groups and um, you don't want to do what I think in my view England has done which is to turn the apprenticeship system into a broad sort of mass population system when it may not be the most appropriate use of the apprenticeship system to do so. So Scotland and Northern Ireland have taken a very different route. Mm. I think in fairness, we, we, all we can say at the moment is there's a long way to go to bed in the new system, but the, the aspiration was noble uh, if the execution's been a bit um, stuttering so mm. far. Um, will your third stage report be tackling these issues? Because it does sound to me as if you're going to have to be quite imaginative to come up with uh, solutions that embrace incentivizing the individual employer and the provider. This is the, the three car trick that I'm not sure anybody's pulled off yet. Yes. So we don't want to reveal all yet because you haven't finished the report. But could you just give us a flavor uh, of the type of recommendations that will be coming through? Yes, and I think firstly to manage expectations for our viewers um, <laughs> that uh, we don't expect and nor do we hope to fix the whole system with these oh. next reports, I'm afraid. Um, but you but, might get closer than anybody else has so far. Well, and I, and I think it has been a very different approach to, to other research projects. Um, so hopefully we will make progress that seem that high, um, or at least make recommendations that would. I think in terms of the flavour of the recommendations, you're right, you know, how do you work to get learners uh, demanding and, and um, entering the skill system to higher levels than we currently do? How do you get employers engaging and investing in skills, but crucially using those skills higher than we currently do? And within the context of public funding or government more generally, how do we make sure that the funding levels are right? And I think that probably means increases. Um, but also, how do we make sure that the policy and strategies are right, the structures, if you like, are in place for the employers and for the learners? Um, some of the flavours of the recommendations, so looking, I suppose, at um, how you get coherence across the system. So again, you've heard already, but I think Scotland has Maybe an advantage there is a little bit ahead of the game, at least in terms of the policies that are in place. And the, the learning certainly flows in the direction of Northern Ireland, I think, in that case. So what can Northern Ireland do to catch up? That shouldn't be transplanting or borrowing policy from Scotland. That should be the learning from what's happened in Scotland. So looking at outcomes, looking at um, systems, wide approaches, looking at how you can garner collaboration rather than competition. For the learners, um, uh, again, I, we're not sure that the structures are in place for those over 21, over 25. So we're not convinced at this point that apprenticeships, uh, you know, the simply extending or equalising the funding arrangements for all ages within apprenticeships would do the trick. Because we don't think that apprenticeships necessarily should be for everyone um, throughout every stage of their career. So do we have the provision in place already? Can FE do that? And if not, do we need something else? Um, particularly focused on in-work training for that progression outcome. 
But also there's funding, so within learners, individuals, employees, are there things you can do with funding arrangements to encourage that demand for learning, um, which we could look at. Scotland has a, an equivalent to an ILA, an individual learning account already, it's called an ITA. Um, does, is that something to build on? And equally does Northern Ireland need to look at something similar? Um, That's very interesting because of course the, the attempt to bring in ILA's individual learner accounts in England was again a, a casualty of an overrushed implementation and a failure to regulate uh, new providers properly. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. apprenticeships. But I was interested in doing some background reading uh, that quite a number of countries, I think I can reel off Denmark, Estonia, Singapore. France, yeah. France are, are going down that route because it is the obvious way of involving the individual taking some ownership building up some kind of pool of resource, whether actual cash or credits or whatever, and the providers then having to meet that, with employers being able to say this is relevant, this isn't. So I think what we're not convinced by is the, the England approach, which um, this is maybe a stereotype or an unfair characterisation, but for universities, it's placed pretty much all of the funding into the hands of the student or the learner through the tuition fee system. So there's very little government sort of shaping of the provision on offer um, within universities, in our view, not enough. Um, within vocational learning or technical learning or in work learning, they've done the same but for employers through the apprenticeship levy. So you pretty much put through a voucher system a huge amount of the investment for that part of the system into the hands of employers. Now the problem there is that, and dare I say it, but what if employers don't know what's best for their uh, organisation beyond the next few months? What if uh, rational decisions at the individual employer level don't add up to a rational decision at the, the sort of group, the, the country-wide level? And so we're not convinced that putting vouchers fully into the hands of whether it be learners or employers is the right route to go. We do think that collaboration approach requires a government or system-wide approach. Um, but that's not to say you can't do something in that territory. The really interesting international, so Singapore um, did, uh, and it's quite in vogue to compare Scotland to Singapore just now, even though they're very different countries in many ways. But um, so I won't fall into that trap, but, um, but Singapore, nonetheless, um, has uh, it did this, um, this bit of work called the Committee on the Future Economy. And I think we're really interested in whether something similar should happen in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, which looked at automation and asked the question, how can Singapore get ahead of the rest of the world on that? And I think they were quite surprised that uh, lifelong learning became one of the biggest parts of that, uh, of that committee's recommendations. So they set the ambition in Singapore not far off um, at the level that every single person of working age within Singapore should be engaged in the skill system every single year throughout the whole of their career. So you never leave <laughs> in a good way. Um, yeah. And we're very, very far away from that in both Scotland and Northern Ireland and in fact across the UK. So what would that look like? What would that level of ambition look like? And part of the way they've done that is through individual learning accounts. In France, um, in essence, unlike an ILA, which, if you like, um, evaporates each year, <laughs> you know, you use it or you lose it. In France, um, they've, uh, they're setting up a system that allows you to almost save up over a few years. Mm. And that's been the problem with ILA uh, and, yes. to some extent, ITA, which is it's such a small amount, so around £200, I think it was, for training, which makes a difference, but won't make a huge transformational difference. So how do you get the, maybe the, the figure up? How do you do some of the things that France, uh, for example, is doing around saving that up over a period of time? Or in Singapore, how do you reach that level of ambition that yeah. suggests you never leave the skill system? And certainly we've got, in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, people leaving the skill system at the age of 15, which is far too early. People leaving even 18 and 21. Um, and you can argue whether people should leave at all. <laughs> um, you know, should, should you have an expectation throughout your career of having to and wanting to retrain, keep your skills up to date in a way that allows you to um, recognise that learning wherever you move, whether that be career, sector, employer. So these are the big questions we're, mm. we're sort of chewing over just now, if you like, in terms of recommendations. Um, 
individual learning accounts, yes, you know, they're interesting. I don't think going back to what we had yeah. in the rest of the UK yeah. is the best plan, but taking inspiration from where uh, you see it internationally, I think could be an interesting. I think Denmark um, links it to a kind of unemployment insurance scheme. So you build up a credit and they're accepting that automation and other changes will lead to unemployment, but there's a pot of money there to enable you to retrain up skill. And yeah, focusing on those sectors that are most vulnerable in, yes. in inverted commas could be an interesting route. Um, and equally focusing on parts of the, um, the income spectrum or the skills spectrum that are likewise most most vulnerable to automation could be an interesting route. I was stunned when I read in your report that Scotland and Northern Ireland hadn't gone the same way as England in raising the effective leaving of the education age to 18. Though I don't think it's been enforced sufficiently in England. I, I was amazed that they hadn't uh, uh, followed suit and I'd, I'd be expecting to see something at stage three on that. <laughs> and on Singapore, The Economist uh, ran an article a couple of weeks back that as part of this thinking through in the future, they're changing their schooling system, the mm -hmm. much vaunted system based to a large extent on, or heavily on knowledge and uh, examination. They're saying now, would you believe we need to emphasize soft skills of resilience, personal resilience, capability, working cooperatively. So again, although it's not entirely in your remit, you, you would be entitled to have something to say about schools and education well, pre-60. And it's a really good example of where, again, Scotland, so people like it, people dislike it, but the Curriculum for Excellence has, I mentioned earlier, as a, as a generational policy um, implementation. It is now fully up and running um, and it is based on all of those um, you know, future-looking ways of doing education around resilience, around competencies, around attributes of pupils rather than around knowledge and rote learning, if you like. Um, the idea being that those are the skills we will need people to have in the future that allows them to navigate big disruption. Um, now, in Scotland, the school system, I think, is ahead of the game in that sense. Whether you like curriculum for excellence or not, whether you think it's been implemented successfully or not, the idea is a strong one. In Northern Ireland, I think the education system is in a, uh, sorry, the school education system is in a very different place. And just more generally, can the rest of the skill system learn from that curriculum for excellence? So yeah. are we future-proofing, if you like, learning enough so that rather than just training people for the work that they're currently in and for the skills that they currently need and actually sometimes for what their employer needs, do we not need to ensure that we've got a responsibility to the learner to, to make sure that their learning now is something that's useful for their next job? or that's useful for the future economy. Um, because what we don't want to do is continually you know, chase our tail yeah. with this. We want to put and embed some of the skills, some of the attributes, some of the competencies throughout the college, throughout the in-work training system as much as in the school system. So yes, I think there is, you know, that isn't the focus of the report. No. It is much more post-school sub-degree uh, and it hasn't been a focus of the project. But as I say, you know, I think there's implications for schools and universities from some of the recommendations and likewise learning that can come in from that part of the school system too. Well, it sounds that it's going to be a, an exciting report, which is not always how one would describe <laughs> reports on the skills system. But I can't, I can't let us finish without <laughs> addressing the elephant in the room, the B word. Oh, what about Brexit? I thought we'd gotten through the whole... No, uh, no, no. Would any um, of this change or, or do they stand square whether we have a no deal, good deal, bad deal? Well, one of the tragedies of Brexit, regardless of how you voted, whether you were a Remainer or a Lever or continue to be one or the other, one of the tragedies of Brexit is that it's completely um, exhausted all oxygen for debate mm. of anything else. Uh, if not just exhausted people <laughs> entirely. But um, you know, there are big, huge challenges that completely transcend whether we're in the European Union or not. Automation, ageing, getting our economy back in terms of performing well in a fairer way. These are things that, yes, Brexit will have um, you know, an effect on, but these are things that predate um, the Brexit vote and will absolutely be here unless we take action, regardless of the deal or no deal. 
that we have with the EU. So I think the tragedy has been that you know what we're trying to talk about and generate interest in within the skills system, but more broadly across other work, um, looking at the economy, um, we don't have a receptive audience among policymakers just now because they are so consumed for good or for bad with Brexit. I think more specifically on your question though, so does Brexit change the needs or requirements of the skills system? Clearly, and we've already seen this, immigration um, and skills go hand in hand. So I think too often in, in this country, if you forgive getting a little controversial or, uh, in regards to immigration, we see immigration as almost a security issue, when in actual fact it's a skills issue. Um, you know, you bring in the skills you need from outside of the country uh, to boost your economy and to supplement your skill system. Um, so of course, immigration changing will change what the skill system is required to do and what we need from it. But that has already happened. So we've seen um, since the vote, never mind whatever deal we have, immigration levels dropping. We can look ahead, I think, regardless of um, the deal or no deal, or whether we stay or whether we go, to a very different shape and type of immigration than we've had in the past. And that does lead to big implications, particularly actually, well, for both Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, but Northern Ireland has a land border, it has uh, all the connections with the rest of the island of Ireland. And, um, and there, you know, there's a huge dependence on EU workers from Ireland, of course, but from uh, beyond that too. So the skills system will be asked to do a lot more if immigration is, is dropping. Um, and then bring into the mix the ageing um, population. So we've, we've done some work through the reports actually that show, I think for the first time, um, put some numbers on um, the, the ratio between pensioners and workers over time, regardless of the pension age changes. They look a bit scary. So um, you know, it's a good thing that the population is ageing. There's huge opportunities from that, but huge financial challenges too. So in Northern Ireland, I think there's 26 pensioners per 100 workers now. To give you an idea, by 2040, that will move to 35 pensioners per 100, around about a 40% increase. So unless you boost productivity, um, assuming immigration can't get you through that, um, we're going to see some really hard, um, uh, I suppose, effects on the life chances of people. So yes, I think um, immigration really does change the requirements of the skill system particularly in the context of ageing. And it really points to what, uh, what the same factors that, uh, that automation point to, which is we're going to have to work very hard with our existing and remaining working population. Uh, we can't just work with young people and pretend that that will be enough to get us through ageing and automation and Brexit. Instead, we need to work with those that are over 21, over 25, already in the workplace. So that if you like, the challenge of the 1990s recession was getting people back into work. The challenge of this recovery is getting people into higher quality work. Mm. And that has to be a big, huge uh, priority for the skill system. Thank you very much. Should we just outline when the report's going to be published and how we're going to follow up this in conversation with a webinar? Yes, so the report, as we talked about at the start, so we're into um, a, a very exciting, you said, I, I say exciting and interesting part of the project, which is the recommendation stage. Um, we are in the midst of writing that now, so the report, the final report, should be out in November of 2018. Um, and beyond that, we're, we're looking to do a webinar with FETL on the recommendations and on the project as a whole, so that we can really get as much engagement as possible from, from all those connected to FETL, all those interested in the skill system in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Disagree with the recommendations, agree with them, even better. Um, but uh, absolutely engage with them, because we don't think this is the last word. We don't think we'll fix everything with this report, but we do hope this is the start of a conversation about how we do, do that. Russell Gunson, thank you very much. Thank you.